So today, we sang Lift High the Cross. Now, how many of you have always thought that's an Easter song? Any of you? Did it seem strange singing it during Lent? Maybe? It's not typically a Lenten song. It's not really in the Easter section of our hymnal, but then again, some of these songs don't necessarily fit into easy categories. And this is one of those. And I debated whether or not to pick Lift High the Cross just because it might have an Easter association. You know, we're supposed to bury the Alleluia's during Lent, and that's why we've been speaking some of the liturgy uh, that makes a, a change so that when we do get to Easter, we'll be singing it again, it'll be joyful. That's why we omit Alleluia portions of the liturgy and include those uh, at different times. So, uh, during the year, apart from Lent. Well, today, we sang a song that might be considered an Easter song, but I wanted to include it because it fits so well with the scriptures that we heard, first from Numbers and then from the Gospel. In Numbers, where we hear the story of the serpent and the pole, and in the Gospel lesson, where we hear Jesus echo that story and share it again with Nicodemus. And the point of it is this, that we were dead. That we were dead, and through Christ are made alive. We can lift high the cross because we were dead. Because it's empty. Now, sure, that's an Easter idea. But as I said in my newsletter, why do we do this again and again? Why do we celebrate this season over and over? Are we re-crucifying Christ? Are we going through the motions again? Well, in a way, we're acting as if, so that we can remember each year, as an annual remembrance of Christ's suffering and death and resurrection. But the reality is we live in an Easter world, even during the season of Lent. We still rely on Christ crucified as our salvation and nothing else. So what does it mean to say that you were dead and you were alive? Well, let's consider some contrasts. One of the favorite hymns of all time, which, you know, hopefully fittingly chose today as our closing hymn, Amazing Grace. It's one of the most popular songs of all time. In fact, I was flipping through uh, the, the channels the other night <clears throat> see our son gets up early in the morning and he's learned how to come downstairs and turn on the TV and so I make sure that whatever channel it's on before I go to bed is the channel that he'll wake up and turn it to and so he turns it on to you know, whatever it is and lately it's been the Dish Earth channel which is just an earth and some quiet music it's wonderful, very relaxing in the evening Sometimes it's PBS, because I know they have good kids' shows on in the morning. And so I turned it to PBS, and there was, well, he's not my favorite person in the world, because he speaks half of the truth most of the time, and a little more than that some of the time. And occasionally he gets all of the truth right, but there's enough of the half-truth to make it muddy the waters a bit. Something like that? Yeah. At least he ends with a children's choir singing Amazing Grace. Interestingly enough. Now, whatever you may think of him or not think of him, he ends with a children's choir singing Amazing Grace. I thought that song has become so popular in our culture. And he gives a little bit of the backstory before they sing that song about the man who wrote it, who had been in the slave trade, who on a ship across the ocean, came, this came to him, and he wrote this song about his being a wretch, and how the Lord could save a wretch like him, and if God could save a slave trader, God could certainly save us. And while that is absolutely powerful and potent to consider in our lives, that those who have lived a life of sin, those who, for whom we might think, well, I'm not worthy of God's love, people who would never darken the door of a church, yet somehow find themselves wrapped in God's love, embraced by God, 
feel that amazing grace and think, yes, if God could save me, God could save anyone. In fact, if God could save me, God has to save anyone. That salvation, that love has to be available for anyone. And so we sing, I once was lost, but now I'm was blind, but now I, right? Lost and found? Well, even if you get lost, eventually you're going to stumble your way somewhere. You remember the old adage, wherever you go, come on, wherever you go, there you are, right? <laughs> you're not lost, you just don't know where you are. You're there, aren't you? And though you're blind, there are many ways around that. Many people are literally blind and live quite well in the world. One, in fact, Ken Miedema, a blind musician, has an amazing Christian witness. He takes the words that people say, the, the sermons that pastors preach, and on the spot he comes up with a song. He's absolutely amazing. And I've been privileged to... Uh, have him play at a service in which I was able to preach. And I'll never forget that sermon because he made a song about it. <laughs> it sticks with you. Luther was right. A word sung is twice learned. So sure, the blind can do just fine in this world. Maybe God heals a few every now and then. That's good, yes. So if you were lost, great. You can be found. If you're blind, you don't have to see. You'll do all right. Oh, but maybe the song's not talking about earthly blindness, but spiritual blindness. Jesus talks about that. That could be what it's really about. But even that is not deep enough. No, we need to get down to the common denominator. That is what one of my favorite characters of all time, Animal Smith, had this to say behind his cigar. He said, Face, someday we're all going to be pushing up, count, pushing up daisies in the county. Death. You've got to get down to that level of being dead. It's the common denominator. Last I heard, the death rate was still the same, one per person. How do you get around that? You don't. You can't run from it. It catches it up, catches up with us. It's one of those popular icons in our culture. What does death look like? Come on. Describe him. Tall, right, maybe? What is he wearing? A black cloak of some sort. What is he carrying? A scythe. And I don't know where we get this image of the Grim Reaper from because the Bible gives us the joyful reaper coming to harvest the souls. It always surprises me when I get to that, even though I know it's there. Oh, we get the skeleton with a big hood carrying the scythe, ready to harvest the souls. I found an old scythe in my grandfather's shed. Uh, not the grandfather I went to visit, uh, other, the other one who died long ago. And his old shed is just full of rusty old stuff. And so when we were back there, I took Andrew out there and I said, this is the kind of place that we warned you about not playing in. Come on, let's take a look. <laughs> <laughs> and found his old side. And swung that a few times. Too rusty to cut anything. That's our image of death. Death has become stereotyped. That, perhaps that image of the Grim Reaper, we like that because it gives us something tangible to hold on to about death. But in the end, death is a hard reality. No matter how you think of it, whether you hope for it, whether you wait for it with joyful expectation of meeting your Lord, whether you dread it, whether you fear it, whether you have nightmares about, about it, it's going to happen. But we who have Christ have an assurance that death is not the final word. 
So we have a story of Christ being lifted up and of a, of a pole being lifted up, of poisonous serpents. Now, there are a lot of fears out in the world. Uh, many of you may have some irrational phobias and fears. How many of you uh, will admit to being afraid of snakes? Any of you? A few of you? Spiders? Closed spaces? I think that's probably why the movie uh, Snakes on a Plane caught on so well, is that it was a closed-in, claustrophobic space, you know, pressurized aluminum tubes zooming through the air, filled with snakes. You know. Let's take a claustrophobic situation and add something people are afraid of. Right? Well, we may be afraid of snakes, but we have good reason. In this case, the people of Israel, wandering in the wilderness, complaining against God, so God sends poisonous serpents among the people that bit the people so that many Israelites got sick. That's not what it said. Many Israelites died. There used to be a standard in television, and that is family shows, like the one I mentioned before, the A-Team, that were on during a certain slot. You could fire all the guns you wanted, but you couldn't show anyone getting shot and killed. You could see the Jeep flip over and crash, but the guys driving it had to run away from it before it exploded. People couldn't really die. That standard went out the window a long time ago. Now people die left and right on television. It used to be when the gunfighter shot the other guy down and he grabbed his side and he fell. You didn't see all the blood. You just saw him fall dead in the street. That was a scandal. Somebody died on television. Then we began televising war. And that had the terrible effect of raising people's awareness about war. To the point that they said, no, we don't want this. That caused a whole bunch of controversy about people who went and people who didn't and how we treated them. But it also made a change that now when we watch war on television, we see it from a distance like a video game. In fact, there are some guys who, uh, after they are done flying their drone thousands of miles away, get to stop at In-N-Out on the way home. Because they go to war at an office in California. We remove ourselves from death in many ways. We set it aside. We keep it at a distance. But we can only keep it at a distance for so long for it will catch us. So it is with sin. We don't often equate sin and death. We might appear, but how often do you really think, oh, I've sinned, now I'm going to die? You think, I've sinned, now I need to be forgiven. Or I've sinned, boy, I'm going to be in trouble. But not I've sinned, now I'm going to die. But Paul makes it very clear. The wages of sin are sickness, suffering, Hurt feelings, guilt, no, death. Again, it comes back to that common denominator, that lowest point for all of us, death. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to polish it any other way. It's a terrible thing for those of us who live. I've often said, it's been said before, that funerals are for the living. Sure, we honor the dead, we lift up the dead, we remember the dead, they live on in our memories, but they're for us, the funeral. So we have the serpent lifted up so that those who died, well, they're out of luck. But the people who are bitten, what chance do they have? We've sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. And so God took away the serpents, right? No. The serpents represent death, hard reality. It happens. You've got to deal with it. You can't just wish it away. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, tell you what I'll do. Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it 
them live. Another chance. A second chance. Whereas the former means death, bitten by the serpent, the latter, like the serpent on the pole, means life. This is not the end. You do get a chance. I saw a mystery recently in which two men had a knife fight. And one of them got stabbed. And he fell down. So I was surprised a few minutes later to see that second man, the one who got stabbed, still alive. I mean, that's how the story was written. They got in a fight, the one got stabbed, but he wasn't killed. But they didn't say that. They just showed him getting stabbed and falling down. And then a few minutes later, there he is alive again. And I thought, how did that happen? And of course, later they explain that the knife didn't really kill him. It's a bit like this. There are some moments in our lives that scare us and shake us to the core. And, oh, were I the kind of preacher that could give you hellfire and brimstone so that you'd be convinced that your sin causes death. But I can't do that sort of conviction. Only the Spirit can give you that kind of conviction. But let me tell you about a death moment that I had. You don't have to have a near-death experience to be frightened into your senses of looking at the serpent on the pole. No, when I was in seminary, I had the privilege of playing Sir Thomas More in the play A Man for All Seasons. I've told this story before. It's hard enough to remember all your lines, but to get beheaded three nights in a row, now that's a trick. And the director, who was our preaching professor, called me aside at one moment during rehearsal and said to me, there's one line you've got to deliver that's going to sell the whole thing. I'm just going to say it for you here. I'm not going to try and do it the way I did then. Kind of got to be in the moment and get in the spirit of things. And that line is when Sir Thomas, in the midst of the legal proceedings, realizes that he has no chance, that he's going to be executed. And he says, I am a dead man. He says, if you just get up there and say, I am a dead man, it won't fly. But if you think of a time in which you almost died... And imagine that moment. And get that in your head and then say that line. He says, you'll be surprised. You'll deliver it and it'll sell. People will really believe that you are about to go to your death. And you know, I think it worked. I thought of a time in which I was nearly killed. In a car accident. I wasn't even damaged. The car wasn't even hurt. But I realized in that moment that that could have been me. But for some strong angels holding on to the sides of that car, keeping me out of the intersection, that could have been me. We need a wake-up call periodically in our lives to remind us that it someday will be us. But we have the good news of God that when death comes... It is not the final word. It does not mean forever sleep. It does not mean eternal condemnation. Those who believe, who are confessors of Christ, have the hope, above all hope, the hope that even defeats death, that there is life. Since Delbert knows the life, it's just those of us who will know life because of Christ. For God did love the world so much that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him may not perish, may not die, but may have eternal life. Amen.